I am Amanda Kitts. I'm a fourth year here at University of Michigan Pathology, um, and I have the pleasure of introducing one of our attendings, Dr. David Gordon. Um, Dr. Gordon received his undergrad degree from chemistry at Amherst College and graduated from Harvard University Medical School. He completed a one-year medical um, internal medicine internship at University of Massachusetts, Worcester, and then a pathology residency and fellowship at University of Washington, Seattle, where he joined the faculty. He was recruited to the University of Michigan in 1991, and his focus has remained on cardiovascular disease diagnosis, research, and teaching. He has collaborated with five in 1997 through 2001 on cardiovascular drug discovery research. He has published numerous papers and continues to help others with cardiovascular research effort. Uh, Dr. Gordon is a professor of pathology and active, active emeritus faculty member at the University of Michigan Medical School, School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Throughout his tenure, Dr. Gordon has educated medical students and young doctors about numerous diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases. His past leadership roles have included serving as the Associate Dean for Diversity and Career Development at the University of Michigan Medical School, Dean of the former uh, school, now College of Health Professions and Studies at University of Michigan Flint, Dean of the College of Health Professions at the University of Akron, Ohio, and most recently serving as the Associate Medical Director for the Hamilton County Health Network, the largest federally qualified health center in Genesee County, Michigan. In the last role, he expanded his focus to working to improve the health of low-income underserved patients and for individuals returning from incarceration. All of these experiences have reinforced the great need for patient education and advocacy on an individual basis, and thus he has started Take Charge of Your Health LLC, of which he serves as the CEO. Um, and today I've asked Dr. Uh, Gordon just to come and speak with us, um, because as I started working on the diversity and inclusion curriculum here, um, and we got it talking, I realized there was a lot about him that I didn't know yet, even though we had worked together uh, multiple times during autopsy. So, um, Dr. Gordon, I'll just kind of leave it up to you to where you want to start. We can go. For okay, well, thank you so much, Amanda. And, um, you know, I can't see all the participants, but I'm certainly hoping that people will actually make this an informal session. Uh, I always, you know, let's have questions and answers and things like that. I'm happy to I prefer to be interrupted if you have a question about things. Um, as uh, some of you have heard me talk when I talk to medical students, uh, as far as I'm concerned, no question's a dumb question. All questions are politically correct. Uh, so feel free to ask anything, <clears throat> you know, including things like, you know, why would you ever pick something like cardiovascular pathology? Or, you know, as I sometimes prompt medical students, uh, I say, look, you know, if this is your first time, so I, have oriented a lot of medical students to the autopsy as part of our new uh, curriculum where we have medical students uh, who are doing their surgery rotation. Uh, they spend a week with us in pathology and their first stop usually is the uh, autopsy suite. And I tell them, I say, look, you know, this may be your first exposure to pathology and you may think that pathologists are all hunchbacks that work in dark basements. Now, I do have scoliosis and I've been operated on for that, you know, but I'm the only hunchback that I know about in our department. So as you folks know, you know, um, most pathologists, uh, you know, are not hunchbacks and that, you know, we do good things. So anyway, <clears throat> um, Amanda asked me to kind of talk about my career, which has been, uh, I guess, quite varied. And so I, I do this mainly in the spirit to try to let you know what some of the potential opportunities are and that you don't have to sort of, you know, pitch and hold yourself into just one area, but you should lead yourself wherever you think your talents you know, can take you and also be of help to other folks. I mean, that's really been a guiding principle for me, you know, is really where, you know, where can I be most helpful? And in part of that decision making, I often think in terms of, well, if something, someone is already doing it and if it's popular, then, then do they really need me to do that sort of thing. On the other hand, if something needs to be done and nobody else seems to be stepping up to the plate, those are the kinds of efforts that, you know, I find attractive and you know, I try to roll up my sleeves and go after them, you know, type of thing. So that's kind of been a guiding principle through uh, my career. Um, <clears throat> so you folks have all <clears throat> chosen pathology, so I don't really have to tell you that much about, you know, the some of the benefits of uh, pathology. Um, but I will say one of the reasons that I chose pathology and uh, 
was very much early on, I really wanted to do research and I wanted to say a couple of things about a research career. So I got started <clears throat> in uh, research efforts actually as an undergrad in uh, chemistry. Um, I did a uh, chemistry undergraduate thesis, uh, happened to be on transition metal complexes and organometallic uh, compounds. And that was a good experience for me because it allowed me not only just to be exposed to research, um, I often tell people that you can be exposed to research, you know, over a few weeks or maybe a summer, and you can decide from that whether or not you don't like research. But if you're going to think about <clears throat> going further and making a career out of research, you really have to spend longer time than that. So this was about a year project in undergraduate, and then later when I went through medical school, I actually took off what ended up being two years to work, and that was my introduction to cardiovascular research. Um, and I say that because nowadays, if you're going to make a career out of research, it's not enough to know, to spend the time to sort of say, yes, I can do research. <clears throat> yes, I can deal with um, Murphy's Law. Um, but you almost have to have what I would call an addiction for doing research. So I'm, once I got bitten by the research bug, you know, I was never comfortable not getting involved in some research. And even now, even though I no longer run my own research laboratory or sort of pioneer my own research projects, I am helping other people uh, with various research projects. And I am, for example, working closely with one of our interventional radiologists who is interested in looking at vein stents and kind of what leads to their ultimate stenosis and blockage so that they have to be re-stented or the vein has to be repaired and things like that. So I've never fully gotten away from research. And again, it's been an addiction for me. You know, it's the kind of thing um, when, you know, some people for some jobs, they say, oh, I'm going to go in and either, you know, do an autopsy or I'm going to go this and that. I'm looking forward to when this is being done. You know, to me, I ask myself, you know, if it's a job and a chore, it's the kind of thing you don't like to do on your leisure time. On the other hand, if I'm on vacation and someone starts talking about their research, you know, on a Saturday or Sunday or even the evening, I get interested and I start talking with them about it. So, I mean, to me, that's a sign of addiction, if you will. Some people would say it's craziness, overwork, workaholic, you know, that kind of thing. But I've been blessed at least enough to, um, you know, enjoy by and large what I've been doing. So um, I say that because particularly if you're going to pursue a research career. Um, and there are a lot of benefits in terms of doing this out of pathology as opposed to some of the other specialties. I think one of the toughest medical specialties to try to do a research career, particularly if you're going to be doing laboratory research, is surgery because you get such time demands on you and you've got such, in my opinion, sleep deprivation from you know, all sorts of crazy hours that I don't think you can think as critically and as creatively as you could if you were in something like uh, pathology. Um, but you need that, what I call, addiction energy to get by all the hurdles, not just Murphy's Law, but you've got to go ahead and apply for money, you know, for grant monies just to get the opportunity to fight with Murphy's Law. And then if you happen to get some results that are worth publishing, you've got to fight with the publishers to write it up and get it actually published and through, you know, into publication, you know. So it's a whole host of hurdles. If you're doing animal work, as many of you may know, you have to get approval from animal uh, reuse committees, and that can be a number of stumbling blocks, and that's gotten more complicated over time. If you're doing clinical research involving human samples even, uh, not just uh, live patients and things like that, you have to get uh, IRB approval, and that has, has its own set of hurdles. Um, so, you know, if you don't have what I call that addiction energy, that addiction drive to do that kind of research, you're going to be you know, very unhappy and you're going to get caught up on all the way and you're going to get very frustrated. So most of these successful researchers that I know about do have that addiction energy. This is what they love to do. They do it on vacation. You know, they do it at times. And it's not like they feel imposed upon. It's really their love, you know, in terms of what they like to do. And certainly we're not hurting for unmet areas that need to be looked into as far as research. And again, one of the biggest benefits that I found with pathology is that particularly if you want to work on human diseases, um, you have such access to actual human tissues uh, to do all sorts of things, much better than any other specialty. Um, you also, um, I know that, you know, again, please feel free to interrupt me or, you know, I, I assume you can use the chat box to, um, you know, ask questions and things like that. And I'm happy to take questions right in the middle of it. 
Um, but um, I know, for example, um, you know, coming back to the, the research environment, um, you know, the uh, a lot of people um, really worry about, you know, what well, do I really want to make a research career? Do I really want to become an academic? Do I really want to be a professor in the medical school? And as you know, the vast majority of people who you know, finish their pathology residency, you know, will not go into academic medicine. They will go into private practice and, you know, they'll do their things. I always found um, just doing what I call routine pathology, um, while somewhat enjoyable, it had its limits because I was always looking at the different diseases I was facing and saying, okay, where can I make a difference? You know, where can I learn something that's new? And as you can see, even with this coronavirus epidemic, there's an awful lot of stuff that we don't know even in terms of things that we need to learn about uh, this disease process. And as pathologists, um, you know, you are well poised to, to being able to uh, do all sorts of things. I think the other thing I would say uh, from a pathology perspective is that, you know, as some of you have done research, probably cell culture, worked on animal models and things like that. Uh, but oftentimes what I find is that, you know, the animal model and sort of the cell culture work is often what I would call the easier road of doing research, say compared with perhaps maybe clinical research being some of the tougher areas. Uh, but people make all sorts of animal models and animal systems without really knowing the true relevance to the actual human disease. So one area that I focused on a lot uh, was human atherosclerosis. And you know when I got into that field, and even now, you have a lot of animal models, mouse models, cell culture, things like that, but people weren't looking at the actual human disease. You know, to be able to say, okay, how does this match up with the actual human disease? What, you know, if we're talking about a particular growth factor, like platelet-derived growth factor, for example, in terms of stimulating smooth muscle cells to divide, and for a long time, a lot of people were saying this is the major growth factor, you know, that uh, is driving uh, human atherosclerosis. Um, well, in a cell culture system, just to give one small example, you add platelet-derived growth factor to a culture of smooth muscle cells, and they take off in terms of dividing. You may have a number of cells, percentage of cells that are proliferating called the proliferative index of 20%, 30%, in some cases, 100%. Uh, and people were saying, see, this you know, growth factor is doing its thing. Well, I was one of the first people to look at actual human plaques and say, is there any proliferation going on in the human plaques? And it turns out that there's damn little proliferation going on in actual human plaques. You know, in the studies that uh, we did, uh, we found maybe most plaques having a zero to one percent of cells showing any proliferative activity with an occasional plaque maybe up to five percent and this is despite the presence of platelet derived growth factor actually not only pdgf but also a whole host of other growth factors inside the atherosclerotic lesion so by putting that kind of reality test which pathologists can do a great job of um, you're able to put into context and sort of say hey growth factors is the only thing and as the field evolved, it turned out there are also a number of growth factor inhibitors. And then there are also other requirements for cells to divide. They have to have the appropriate receptors for the growth factors, and that modulates up and down. And so atherosclerosis as a field then became a much more complex area to tackle from a research point of view. And we still don't have all the questions about what causes uh, atherosclerosis plaques. But again, being able to go back and forth between sort of what I would call the basic science and animal model stuff and actual human disease. Uh, observational studies, I think is very important and is one way that I think pathologists in particular can take a major lead in terms of doing that kind of uh, research. So let me pause at this point and see, are there any questions about people who are crazy enough to uh, want to go into academics um, and uh, pursue an academic career? So any questions? Like, um... <clears throat> Nothing so far in the chat, but I had a question. So I think coming into University of Michigan, um, I kind of wanted to do academics, but now I'm seeing that at least the, some of the younger clinical faculty that I work with is kind of being stretched really thin as far as balancing research and clinical practice and being able to teach and stuff. And I was just wondering if you had any experience with that. Yes. Um, so Currently, the way um, our faculty rank, I mean, we have Michigan, for example, has like three main um, uh, faculty tracks. It may have a fourth one mainly focused on uh, sort of administration, but mostly it's three. So you have your so-called research faculty, which mostly are involving PhDs, not MDs. Uh, then you have your clinical track faculty, and that's probably the faculty that you're seeing the most of 
you know, in our department. So these are people who are not expected to go out and get their own grants necessarily, although they can, um, but they typically are hired for their ability to do clinical service work um, and to do teaching on the side while they're doing that clinical service work. And so that's kind of the deliverable that's expected of them. If they get involved in research, um, unfortunately, you know, it's expected that, well, they'll do that on their own time, or I think our department may have something like you have given 10% of your time, you know, to focus on research projects, which frankly isn't a lot of time. And if you're doing what I call competitive research, certainly grant dependent research, you know, I used to tell young faculty that if you weren't voting at least 50% of your effort towards that research effort, you were not competitive because you're competing, you know, particularly from a grant point of view, um, you know, with people who are spending, you know, up to 100% of their time doing uh, research. And so uh, I think for the people who are on clinical track, it's particularly difficult for the reasons that you mentioned. Um, and then I think the other thing is that it's, um, it becomes a, um, what do you call it? Um, a, a lifestyle balance question, you know, because if you're going to say, well, I'm going to really have to dig into my weekends and evenings to get this research done, you know, that's time taken away from family, you know, and that makes an extra strain. Now, you've got crazy people like myself who have been willing to juggle that kind of thing and say, I like research enough that I want to do. I will admit, at the beginning, I had qualms about uh, whether or not I wanted to have kids. I do have two kids. They're grown now. Uh, I'm glad uh, my wife <laughs> convinced me to go ahead and have kids because it's been such a great learning experience uh, in terms of just learning how people develop learning different personalities and things like that. But that's particularly hard. Now, probably the better way to do research if you're going to do that is, again, what I did when I came in, it was a bit of a different era. Um, I joined straight into the tenure track. And in the tenure track, you know, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, you're expected to get grants and to, um, you know, fund, in my case, I was told by my department chair, Peter Ward at the time, who's still in our department, um, that I had to earn half of my salary based on grants, and I had to fully support any laboratory effort I did. The quid pro quo then was that I had at least 50% of my time that I could devote to uh, that kind of research. And that model, you know, if you can be successful in getting the grant, does free up the time, and it's recognized that, you no, know, they can't be imposing a lot of clinical duties on you. You have to have that In effort, and if the chair doesn't, if you fail to get the grants, um, typically your chair would come around to you and say, Well, maybe we ought to move you to the clinical track, or maybe we ought to give you more clinical duties, or maybe you don't need your lab space anymore, and things like that. So, as long as you can be successful, that's probably the better way, and you can guarantee you have the time to do that. But I agree, it's a real challenge for clinical uh, track faculty to do clinical research because, you know, I mean, just in general, I mean, um, pathology is like a business. You know, uh, you have to follow where the money is. And most of the money comes in from doing, you know, seeing clinical samples and writing diagnoses and putting in the bills for that. So that's why the department puts so much emphasis, not just our department. I mean, this is yeah. also in internal medicine and other areas as well. So I don't know if that addresses your question, but yes. Um, yeah. I will say it takes a certain, again, craziness and addiction energy to want to do and be successful in research. I remember early on when I was a professor at um, University of Washington, I asked the usual question, which maybe you as residents have heard too many times, you know, gee, are you thinking about an academic career? And I remember one resident being very open to me and saying, well, Dr. Gordon, you know, I have been thinking about an, uh, an academic career, but watching you and your colleagues pull your hair out and running here and there and running ragged and things like that, um, uh, yeah, I've heard, I've heard I've heard that a lot. I've heard that yeah, a lot. I mean, and I can understand it, you know, type of thing. I think our department also could be doing some better jobs in terms of how we mentor junior people to, uh, you know, actually get research done. Because there are some tricks and things like that. But nonetheless, pathology is more forgiving than other areas. You know, you don't have patients waiting to be seen. You know, I can have a stack of slides that I can put off for an hour while I'm doing some research and then come back to them. You know, I don't have overhanging responsibilities in terms of someone calling me up about, you know, a prescription in the middle of the night or things like that, you know. And there's very relatively little night call. Yeah, I know we do have frozen sections that we occasionally have to deal with in the middle of the night. But compared to 
other yeah, comparatively yeah absolutely yeah i i would kind of echo that too as i came into pathology not really quite sure where i was going to go i knew i was in the military but even mm -hmm. beyond that are kind of how i wanted residency to look but um okay. i think pathology as a whole is very diverse and has a lot of opportunities and ways that you can really make it a unique experience for you. And the other mm -hmm. thing is you don't have to know all the answers at the beginning. Like people are very open to allowing you to try different things or we've had residents switch from AP CP to just CP or AP CP to just AP or, you know, different fellowships or just, and a lot of it is working together and communicating what we need and kind of mm -hmm. working together to try to, figure out a solution so um, yeah. I found at least in pathology in my experience comparatively to the other medical specialties we're pretty good at being a really collaborative and um, open mm -hmm. space where it's okay to be wrong and we are kind of given that a bit of a luxury that our patients are not just physically waiting for us like we have their tissue and we have their slides and we have to be you know cognizant of that but we're not like running to the next appointment which i really like it's kind of a in general a more relaxed work more environment um, yeah absolutely yeah. um we do have a question uh yeah. kind of about yeah. mentees um mm -hmm. from reagan reynolds she said can you talk about some of your mentees how did they help you in research and where did that lead them in their careers okay um, so let me first start, let me turn around a little bit and say, you know, it's also important to have a mentor or mentors. You don't have to have one mentor for yourself, particularly when you're starting out. I think a lot of people, particularly on the tenure track, um, get the impression that, gee, I have to do this myself. I have to show independence. And, you know, those are criteria that are listed to get promoted and things like that. But hardly anybody does it totally by themselves. Um, and so it's good to try to check out different people who might be you know potential mentors see what you're interested in see who's doing stuff that might be interesting and then what i advise young faculty to do or even young residents to do is to kind of apprentice themselves to someone to get a sense in terms of what they're doing um, you will get better mentorship from someone if you uh feed into what they care about i mean let me give you one example um, so when I uh, was um, a still a pathology resident um, at University of Washington, uh, they had a number of uh, basically basic science faculty that were very interested in vascular biology. And they were, again, having made all sorts of models. But by my being a pathology resident and being a postdoctoral fellow, and someone doing vascular biology, they didn't have access to the human vascular tissues. And so I was their conduit to doing that. As a result, you know, I was a value to them. They spent more time with me. Um, and so as a result, we got grants done, we got, you know, papers done and things like that. By contrast, I remember talking with another fellow who uh, was interested in uh, uterine fibroids, for example, and he was wondering why a particular mentor who had no interest in <laughs> uterine fibroids, as it turned out, why he wasn't, you know, really spending time with him in terms of, you know, uh, doing that. Now, Again, uterine fibers are smooth muscle. He was interested in smooth muscle. The mentor was interested in vascular smooth muscle, just not uterine smooth muscle or prostate smooth muscle. Actually, the prostate is what he was working on. And so my advice to him was to say, look, put your prostate stuff on hold. You can learn a lot of smooth muscle biology from this guy by feeding into projects that he cares about because he's got data he's got to get in order to get his grants funded, get papers published and things like that. And if you do that, he's going to give you much more feedback in terms of you know how, what you need to do to write a good paper write a good grant and things like that i mean and you have to kind of you know be a little bit humble in that when i first started writing my grants um, you know my mentor covered my paper with red ink you know with all kinds of comments like you know you know g dave you know better than this you know how could you say something so stupid as this you know g dave think about this and this and this you missed this reference and things like that and you, you kind of have to have you know a bit of a tough skin let the ring roll on that because when i kept at it and knew that he, I was still working on something that he really cared about over time, he helped develop me into a great grant writer and also a much better writer of, um, of um, papers as well. So I think that's been helpful. Now to take the converse on that, most people who are successful uh, researchers, you know, and you can pick all the big names in there, they've all done this by the help of mentees. 
So, I mean, you need people who are young folks to kind of help get things done. I'll give you a counter example to that where I'm sort of struggling myself right now. So right now, uh, I don't have a laboratory that I'm running. I'm working on this project to try to figure out what is the sequence of events of stenosis in vein grafts over time. And it looks as though we're getting some components of thrombus, some components of smooth muscle cells growing into it, collagen formation, maybe some ongoing organizing thrombus and things like that. Um, and a lot of this work is coming from having looked at a whole bunch of samples that the interventional radiologist David Williams pulls for me. But all of the legwork in terms of uh, things like, you know, doing checking in the charts and finding some of the clinical data, you know, looking at all the slides, estimating what percentage of the tissues are there, taking photographs, you know, uh, running the statistics, things like that. I'm having to do myself, you know, and as a result, it takes a long time because I have to find the time to do that. If I had someone who could work with me, now unfortunately I don't have any money to pay such an individual, um, things would go a lot better. So I think you will find a lot of people who have projects, you know, that are basically being stymied because they don't have some help from junior people. And if it's a true synergistic type of thing, you know, then I think both the mentor and the mentee can uh, benefit. So mentees help a great deal. I mean, I think if you didn't have mentees in this whole operation, uh, research operation in the United States would very quickly grind to a halt because uh, you know we need young people to kind of you know get in there and also people are young mentees are very good in terms of challenging you you know we sometimes get stuck in certain ideas and a mentee can say well why is that what's the data for that you know gee i've got a different approach why can't it be this and that and that's always been the stimulating type of thing about uh, research so mentees are very you know valuable um things yeah that's i the, think um oh sorry yeah i think at least here some of the frustration has been just that we don't have a more formalized kind of mentorship program and i know my first year we had like a buddy program almost where we were just paired up with fourth years on our first ap rotations and even just having someone there knowing that like they were there to help that was the person who had the scheduled time to help you and um was really just kind of comforting when you were starting and so i would like to kind of see something like that Mm -hmm. develop over four years which people can take with them um, but I know at least for some of us in my personal experience with research like I've been very discouraged because one time I was given the wrong data set to work on and I worked oh, on it for hours mm -hmm. one time I wrote a paper for an attending two years ago and I still haven't gotten a draft back yet and it's like I personally don't have time to be like making sure that these things keep getting done like I kind of feel like as a mentee I need someone to also step up and do their part. And so after getting yeah. being burned twice, I'm kind of like, well, no, I'm, I'm good for now. So that's, that's been hard. Um, well, and I just, yeah, well, go ahead. Sorry. That was no, awful. no, I, I, I think I hear what you're saying and I'm not surprised in many respects, but I think probably our department and maybe we should have, you know, make a list of follow up questions with the new residency program director. I mean, mm -hmm we should be able to steer residents a little bit in terms of giving them advice about where, who has a reputation for being a good mentee, how do you, mm -hmm. you know, work out a synergistic thing? Because I think some, you know, you may want to call it matchmaking and things like that, but some mentors are a lot better than others. And, yeah. you know, residents probably should be steered towards them to get the best benefit out of them. But also I think residents should be educated to say, okay, let me apprentice myself to them in good faith you know, yeah. and have some other eyes looking at them to see is that happening and things like that. And so I think we could do more as a department mm -hmm. uh, to facilitate that because, I mean, we've got a lot of research going on in the department and yeah. a lot of people who are productive and do have the time. And in some cases, you know, pairing yourself with maybe someone maybe even outside the department. Like I work a lot with people who are in cardiology and vascular surgery, you know, um, frankly, there's more interest in cardiovascular research among those departments than there is in my own pathology department. I'm pretty much mm -hmm. the only cardiovascular person in our department. So, yeah. but you know, so but one could open up opportunities like that. I mean, and I've done a lot of work, you know, with other people and things like that. And so mm -hmm. being able to think out, you know, outside your department sometimes, and that's hard for a resident to do, but yeah. you know, it's easier for, you know, faculty members to do. Because yeah, I, I think it's particularly hard in the residency spot because you're only here for four years. So by the time yeah. you physically move your stuff, your family, 
like get started we're not ma really making that much and so you get settled and by the time like you're learning all this information and working a ton and now we're working like mm -hmm. six days a week on these ap rotations um it's just hard to be able to kind of like process all the information that's out there so it's just kind of how do we make it more i don't know easily deliverable to the people mm -hmm. who need it um so yeah I, I feel like that's something we could definitely work on here yeah yeah, um, yeah. and i'm happy to talk with uh, you know the residency program leadership and you know i mean even i think uh, kathy cho is still our vice chair for research or something like that so okay. i mean i mean yeah. good conversation with her would i think we can fix this yeah right? uh, um yeah that was from jordan reynolds he's a pathologist megan is not the he okay. she is a dietitian. <laughs> right, that's fine, that's fine. Right. This is a question from Carrie. She's Carrie Shrey said, "Can you explain more about your role as an associate dean for diversity and career development at U of M? Do you have any particular achievements that you would like to recognize as a result of your leadership?" Sure. So um, at the time when I started here on faculty, there was no office of diversity and career development for the medical school. Uh, there was a little bit of operations going on. I think in student programs, which is sort of the office that oversees all the, you know, medical student well-being and things, like that, but no real formal program. Um, it turns out I got started, actually I got roped in by the dean of the medical school at the time to help with, as associate dean, to help with faculty affairs issues, because his concern was that, gee, we have a number of faculty, very few faculty of color, how do we recruit more faculty of color, how do we make the faculty of color here, um you know be more successful and you know contact with them and it was a rather backhanded way that he came after me and this is true i mean he said you know it turned out unfortunately you know historically uh when i got finally promoted to associate professor with tenure you know which i thought was you know i mean great um i was informed <clears throat> that i was <clears throat> evidently the only african-american associate professor um you know in the whole medical school and that i was probably the first to become you know, i mean to me that's kind of a sad statistic you know but what they said was that basically we need you to come and help with other administrative duties this is going to take you away from much of your research and so it will probably damage your search career but you know if i don't come after you and i want a person of color to help with this then i have to go with some of your other more junior colleagues and you know what that will do to their careers so it's a very backhanded way of getting me into administration but i said okay you know if you give me some support from my laboratory i'll do it you know kind of thing and so that's when i got involved with various diversity efforts and basically at that time it was more advising you know faculty in terms of how to you know forward their careers linking them with other mentors and you know some mentees and things like that um, Fast forward, uh, the dean that I was working under um, had another dean imposed on top of him who he decided he couldn't deal with. Um, and so he left. At the same time, I had this opportunity to go to uh, work at uh, what was Park Davis and then became Pfizer uh, Pharmaceuticals. And so I had always wanted to work on something from a research point of view that was going to end up with a new treatment. So I left. You know, but during the time I'm there and I'm fast forwarding to that period, um, I figured that a lot of the efforts, and we started a diversity committee, for example, for the medical school to kind of at least talk about what some of the issues were with respect to recruitment. We did a whole diversity audit where we, you know, became apparent that a lot of our faculty of color and students also felt that they were, you know, either, you know, not welcomed or other things like this, that people were looking at them as the only reason you're in the medical school is because of affirmative action, you really didn't qualify to be here. and you know, all sorts of sentiments and things like that. And so we at least began some committees to try to focus on, well, what are we going to do about this? What can we do in terms of diversity education? But then I left to go to Pfizer. And I figured that, okay, if I'm leaving to do something else, someone else is going to step in, the, in my shoes and uh, carry this on. But it turned out over three and a half years that I was working with Pfizer, no one stepped up to the plate. And so finally, these problems persisted. Other issues came up. You know, you had you know, for example, the junior faculty member, I remember in uh, um, internal medicine, uh, <clears throat> dealing with a patient um, that basically, you know, when she went to see this new patient, she was African-American, patient was white, the patient basically just set out flat, you know, I don't want to be seen by a black uh, physician, <clears throat> you know, get me somebody else. 
And so she was quite upset about that. I went to talk to her uh, supervising, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess division head. And the division head basically said, oh, well, that's okay. You know, you go see somebody else and I'll go deal with that patient. And there was no follow up. And so she became even more upset about that to sort of say, why do we not even address this sort of thing? And so that's the kind of thing that came to me and sort of, well, let's go ask Dave Gordon what he would do about this and things like that. So finally, they recruited me back to the medical school. Um, and I set up what was the precursor office of what is now the, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, so this started out in uh, student programs, initially started out as a student uh, operation, but then we expanded it to deal with pre-medical students, helping to get pre-medical students of color or disadvantaged students, not just necessarily African-American or Hispanic, but even poor, you know, rural white kids, anybody who we felt was underserved and disadvantaged. We tried to help them in terms of giving them opportunities in various programs to kind of get them into medical school, give them advice about applying to medical school. We even got funding to work with the dental school and had a whole summer uh, MCAT training uh, <clears throat> program, for example, uh, to help these students, you know, learn about things like that. So we set up a number of programs, which we call pipeline programs. We also had outreach to uh, one of our local um, schools, public schools, the Ypsilanti High School, uh, which is predominantly African American, and to try to get those kids interested in the various health professions. And this is a coordinated effort that I worked with from a grant point of view, funded out of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, that involved not only the medical school, but I actually had to go and do some diplomacy and bring in the dental school, school of nursing, social work, school of education, and basically got this as a joint thing to really expose these kids to all these different, you know, specialties in terms of understanding what their careers could be and helping to mentor them. And so that was something that um, we established and went on for a while. Um, it later was funded by Howard uh, Hughes uh, Medical uh, Institute. And so we also worked with alumni uh, groups because uh, talking about mentorship and menteeship, you know, I mean, a number of African-American alumni, for example, came to me. And they said, look, we had had a pretty rough time when we went to this medical school. We would like to be able to interact with students of color to be able to give them some advice. You know, a lot of them are us in private practice, a lot of us in different fields. We can introduce them to people in the different medical societies. We can show them some of the things in terms of the ropes and help them apply for residency programs and things like that. And so we set up a whole program uh, to do that, uh, you know, and particularly with African-American alumni. We began to do the same sort of thing for Latino alumni and also Native American, um, you know, students as well. And so those are some of the programs that, you know, we ended up uh, setting up. Now, diversity has always been a bit of a um, stepsister, if you will, I think, in the medical school, because it tends to be an afterthought. You have certain people who I think even now feel that diversity is, well, just being, you know, nice to people. You know, they don't want to take the time to really understand where people are coming from. They don't necessarily see a lot of their own built-in biases. I remember having one cardiologist come up to me and say, why is diversity so tough? You know, why can't you give me a card, a cue card that has a checklist on it that says, okay, if I'm dealing with an African-American, I need to do A, B, C, and D. Whereas if I'm dealing with someone from China, I need to do E, F, G, and H. And I said, well, you know, people don't fall into those stereotypical categories, you know, you've got to be willing to meet them as an individual. And one thing I will say, you know, about just in general about diversity, sure, it's important to learn about, you know, here are some hurdles that African Americans deal with. Here are some hurdles and issues and backgrounds that Latino people deal with. Here are some things that, you know, people who are, you know, LGBT have to deal with in terms of discrimination and things like that. But these should be general ideas and things that open your mind your job when you're dealing with an individual is to figure out what is going on with that individual. Don't just apply these things blindly, um, but to try to say, okay, gee, well, maybe this is happening or that's happening. Ask the person. You know, um, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, just are still looking for this cue card. It's sort of like a mentality in medicine to sort of say, you know, well, gee, this disease is supposed to be behaving like this and this and this. There used to be a phrase in our, you know, teaching textbook. Um, Robin's pathologic basis of disease. Um, I don't think it's in there anymore, but there used to be a phrase to say, look, we're teaching you the general outlines and the general you know, ways that different diseases behave. But remember in the individual diseases case, the disease may not have read this textbook <laughs> to know how it's supposed to act. 
I've had so and, many pathologists yeah. tell me that. And it's yeah. so true. And it's and it's true. I mean, it's so true of individuals and things like that. So I saw a need. I got back into that business because no one else was stepping up to the plate. And then I felt that, okay, here are some of the things we can do. So, you know, some of the programs that we started, like this summer program to get high school students to expose, it was a two-week program. I think that is still going on. I don't think the uh, MCAT program is still going on, but we have morphed into other programs that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion are following at this point. And so um, I think my biggest contribution, as I used to say to my staff, who weren't always supported by the rest of the medical school, school frankly, in terms of funding and resources. I mean, we really had to scrimp a bit in terms of really getting things done. Um, but I think I would remind them to say, look, we helped an awful lot of individuals, you know, to get the studies, encourage them, get into medical school, you know, get, you know, to the MCAT and things like that, and mm -hmm. go on and pursue careers, get into different residency programs, because they help to mentor and deal with medical students, you know, junior faculty as well. Yeah. And that it's those individual people that we help. No one could ever take that away from us. You know, yeah, the program names may change. Some of the things may go, you know, I got pressure on me to sort of say, well, you know, you've been doing this for a while, maybe you ought to move on and things like that. You, you can't always control those sorts of things. But I think the individual people that we helped along the line, you know, um, that to me is what I feel most proud about. And it's, you know, really enriching for me to sometimes, you know, be walking the halls of U of M and see someone who say, a resident in EMT and say, hey, Dr. Gordon, I don't know if you remember me, but, you know, I was that student from high school that you came and gave a talk to, or I was the person, you know, who was applying to medical school and you really, you helped me, or your office people helped me do this and this and that. So that's what it I makes a huge important. difference. Yeah. 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 It, yeah, it makes yeah. a difference even just in my experience, like um, I went to Garfield Heights High School, which is outside of Cleveland, and it's a pretty poor community, but the Cleveland Clinic came into our high school class and presented a summer internship that you could apply to, and you would get paid, and you did a research project at one of their hospitals, mm -hmm. and so I worked at Marymount Hospital um, mm -hmm. the, summer, the summer before my senior year and did a project on um, hemostasis with different patches for cardiac catheterization afterward for after they... Mm -hmm. um, take the, the femoral uh, cap yeah. out and just to see how long hemostasis because a nurse or a tech physically has to hold pressure. And sometimes I would do that for a long time until the patient stops bleeding. And yeah. um, mm -hmm. so, you know, without having that exposure, without having the Cleveland Clinic come into my high school and tell me that this was a thing that was available, honestly, it seemed impossible. It was like, yeah. I'm from Garfield. Like, I don't know any doctors. I don't, yeah. you know, my yeah. dad's a lawyer, but I don't know any other lawyers. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like how the the pipeline idea keeps being brought up in a lot of different places I know. Ann Mills at um, University of Virginia is doing this in pathology, and it's something that mm -hmm. seems to have a lot of interest here as well as we start working on our diversity curriculum. So just kind of thinking myself, like, how can I bring this back to the community at, in, at from my home that my parents still live at and who, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. if I was, if I was in school who maybe I could help somebody or show them that this is an option. Yes, you're from Garfield and we don't have a lot of money, but it's still an option. Sure. So, um, yeah. Well, things like yeah. that have been done in our area also. I mean, pathology, for example, used to have a program where they would bring in some high school students in the summertime. It was like an internship type of thing to expose them to different aspects of uh, pathology. Uh, I do know a number of places, even private places like St. Joe's Hospital used to have a program, um, you know, where they would bring in some students to let them shadow some of their positions there and things like that. And oftentimes we can help, you know, make links with other people that, you know, someone can shadow. As you know, to apply to medical school is expected that you do some position shadowing and things like that or work in some sort of volunteer capacity in the department. There's no reason that pathology can't uh, do those sorts of things. So. I think there are a number of things that you know can be done, and they and they mean a lot because to, yep. you know we I mean it's it has to be juggled because sometimes we're so busy that we feel that oh you know, here comes someone who's asking a whole bunch of questions or slowing us down and uh, you know and that is a problem in terms of particularly if you're on a busy clinical service. But at the same time, I think the benefit to those individuals just to be exposed to you and have a uh, the ability to ask questions about your career and see. You know, hopefully you're smiling while you're doing your work and you're not, you know, acting like you're, you know, being burned out, you know, then, you know, that 
encourages other people to say, hey, this is something I didn't think about. And I think also, I mean, in, in with a lot of the programs that I was involved with, it wasn't just medicine, but like with this program we did with the Ypsilanti High School, it exposed them to nursing, dentistry, social work, and a number of other fields. And I think that's something that we don't do enough of. You know, I mean, even in pathology, we have pathology, we have pathology assistants, we have, you know, the whole area of uh, medical technology. You know, a lot of people don't even know about those, uh, you know, careers and things like that. Yeah, I, I, you know, even coming into pathology, like I was only exposed to it my second year. I didn't know what a pathology assistant was. I didn't know what a histotech was. So, and especially mm -hmm. now that we've moved a lot of us off of main campus, we have the room for parking. We, it's a lot more flexible, at least for the yeah. trainees, I think, to be able to reach out. Like the radiology residents, we work with them on some research projects and stuff, but I'm even just thinking like, how can we make some sort of opportunity where we can expose like, you know, mm -hmm. maybe starting with high school, but even prior to that middle school and working your way down, even just having like tours of the department and showing like, what is a pathologist and stuff, because I had never heard of a pathologist before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, the other thing, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, the I other mean, thing I, I was asked. It takes a prime like, mover though. It takes yeah, someone other, in the department who's interested in doing yeah. this and says, we okay. make this happen. The other thing I remember being a barrier is the standardized testing. So like MCAT and stuff, um, I would go to like the public library and take like a test prep class because I couldn't afford Kaplan, things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, we were just having a few more questions if you could talk more about the MCAT program that we used to have. Sure, sure. so what we did, I mean, a lot of students, um, you know, and I think there's a whole literature of uh, on uh, many students of color or many students from disadvantaged backgrounds struggle with standardized tests, you know, um, either from a reading point of view or even some of the, um, you know, the examples that were given. I remember one time, um, you know, being given a question, uh, actually this was in medical school, you know, where someone was trying to test my ability to think through things and, you know, was, you know, the example he gave was something about, okay, imagine yourself, you know, um, you know, uh, on a horse with a bunch of folks and you're going out to hunt, uh, foxes and things like this, you know, what kind of, you know, dogs are you going to take with you? And I'm thinking, hey, you know, I, I never <laughs> grew up in any kind of culture that dealt with fox hunting. You know, I thought this was just on TV and English, British movies or something like this, you know, why are you even asking me this kind of a question? So I had no way of dealing with that, you know, and to some degree, in many subtle cases, a lot of the questions are that way. So it, we felt that, you know, it helps to have some practice. So what we did we got a grant, uh, in this case it was from, um, I believe it was from the Kellogg Foundation to help fund um, a summer program. It was a summer enrichment program and we built into that an MCAT preparation program. There we subcontracted out to Kaplan Associates and basically paid them to run a program for us. Now the way we constructed it, and Kaplan's a pretty smart company, um, you know, they see how pre-med students do on the exam, and particularly later if they become in the medical school and they do very well, they go after the people who got the highest scores and recruit them as Kaplan teachers. So we were lucky enough to get one of our own medical students uh, to be the Kaplan teacher, you know, for the students. And she, I, I can't remember what her own background was, but she was someone who was very good at reading with students, things like that. So this was a summer program where they used Kaplan materials, Kaplan, things like that. And again, these students would not have been able to have afforded a Kaplan program on their own. And so this was built into, I think it was a six week uh, program where they would study for things and then be able to take some practice tests. Mm -hmm. And much of it was just giving them the books, but also the habits and the practice exams. And I think Kaplan made an arrangement with them to say they would have access to the online materials for a year, even after the uh, program ended and things that's like that. Cool. So, so yeah, I mean, those kinds of things, you know, put that kind of help and reach because I think right now, you know, medical school has gotten so competitive and you have enough other people who are using these resources that are rich enough to be able to afford them. Yes, that's that the biggest it, thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you can't get some, I mean, I always advise someone to say, look, try to get into one of these programs if you can. Now, I don't know if uh, an Office of Diversity and Inclusion still runs a program like that. I think they do have some summer programs, okay. but I don't know Let if they ask. have something specifically tailored to the MCAT, but I think that's yeah, I, that's, yeah, that's 
huge because like I'm just thinking like I didn't know anyone else taking it like in college well, in college it was a little bit different but even I went to University of Toledo so we didn't have nearly as many resources as Michigan and things like that mm -hmm. so even still then it was like how do you get creative it's like okay I can't afford a test prep course but I can afford the books or something yeah. like that mm -hmm. so what I, I work a little bit with Kaplan to redo some of their questions and stuff for their mm -hmm. Q bank so let me just reach out okay. to them and see what if anything they have available okay. as far as programs established but that's a really great suggestion that I didn't even really think about is like mm -hmm. if you can't even afford to study for the test then like you're clearly yeah. not and, yeah. and and unless you get into the communities early and show people that this is an option like it's yeah. hard yeah and having served on the admissions committee which was part of my role also being diversity dean um, I mean, you realize that you know, you've got some committee members who really look at that MCAT score. I mean, they say, you know, gee, you have a student who may not have done so well in terms of grades, so they look at the MCAT score to sort of say, well, maybe they can do it generally. If they don't do well in the MCAT score, then they get put down to the bottom of the list, mm -hmm. you know, and for a whole host of reasons, you know, people may have difficulties if they had to, you know, work while they're in college, for example, you know, they may not have had the time to, you know, really, you know, have the kind of activities and things like that or may not be able to afford the MCAT, you know, type of preparation and things like that. So there are all kinds of barriers. Mm -hmm. The ironic thing is that I don't know if people have done further studies, but I mean, we there was a study done here at U of M uh, by the admissions uh, department um, years ago, basically looking at what is the correlation between grades and MCAT scores of incoming students and their actual performance within medical school. And what the conclusion, just to cut to the chase, was that they had different measures of things like that, but on average, the correlation coefficient, you know, for all students was only like 0.2, you know, uh, where one is a perfect correlation type of thing. So there's a lot of scatter in the data. And then when you looked at, sub, looked at the students of color, the correlation coefficient dropped to zero. Mm -hmm. So even though admissions committees put so much stake on these things in terms of saying, well, this tells whether or not this person is going to be a successful medical student or not, it's like, it, it didn't pan out. It didn't yeah. pan out. You know, so now, unfortunately, I don't think the admissions committees, a uh, lot most members would learn from that lesson. But yeah. uh, you know, that's a hurdle that we have um, still to deal with, and uh, you know, hopefully, at some point, that will change. So we'll I think the thing I'm finding is like a lot of this information is out there. It's just it hasn't reached the right person. So I guess my question is like, how, what in your experience has worked as far as like getting the right information to the right person to make some change? So. Um, I think uh, when you say the right person, now in the case of like the admissions committee, you're talking about the admissions committee members, or are you talking about people I guess, and the resources that they can avail themselves yeah, of? Yeah, I guess like in this, school? yeah, in this circumstance, like so the research has already been done and we see there's no really correlation coefficient, but like it's still being used in practice. So how do you so, start? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the roles that I had to play, so I also sat on a, um, an academic review board, which I'm sure they still have some version of that. So in other words, if a student, this is for the medical school, if a student is failing a particular rotation or has to retake a rotation again, and I can't remember what the current policy is, but maybe if you fail two or three rotations, then you're subject to dismissal from the school. Mm -hmm. You know, and so these people would come up and, um, you know, for discussion as to whether or not they should stay in medical school, was medical school appropriate for them, maybe this was too tough for them. And I remember getting into a number of conversations where someone would always say, well, let's look at their you know, admission score. See, this person had a low MCAT score. You know, we shouldn't have been in medical school in the first place. You know, see, this mm. person had, you know, a grade point average of such and such. They shouldn't have been in here in the first place. And I had to be the one to stand up and sort of say, look, you tend to bring up these issues when you're talking about a student of color. You know, we just discussed five other, you know, majority students and they had excellent grades and things like that, but they're still running into problems, you know. Yeah, and yet you yeah. didn't blame it on that. And you're trying to tell the admissions committee to say, be tougher on the MCAT scores, be tougher on these things. These students shouldn't even be getting in here. I don't think that's the problem. So I say that in part because I think you need more people with a broader perspective to be on these committees. And I would say mm -hmm. several committees for any kind of organization, in this case, admissions committee or the academic review committee, 
Uh, certainly, we have committees that help decide whether or not an individual faculty member should get promoted or not promoted. And people who have some sense as to what certain struggles and hurdles people might have, it's very important that they are on these committees so that they can be advocates uh, for folks. Because you yeah. can't leave it up to you know a paper of you know giving this data and expect all the committee members are going to read it and then sort of mm -hmm. say, yeah, I'm going to learn from it. You need constant yeah. advocacy, a constant you know, bringing people, you know, saying, gee, you know, this may not be relevant in this case, or I've talked with this student and this is what really is much more of a problem than that, and this is a way the student can be successful. And if the student hasn't been linked up with a mentor or some other help, maybe we need to try that first before we dismiss the student and things yeah. like that. So yeah, that, yeah, that, I think that, really, looking at all the options, I think we've really fallen into this, like, black and white, only dichotomous two but there's a lot of options it's really taking the second slow down listen see what's going on yeah. look at the whole story not just a piece of it and decide what you're going to do that's correct um, and i think the other thing um you know which is a different mindset i mean i see this in how we practice medicine even we have a tendency to only you may have an office of diversity you may have these but you have a tendency to sort of look at those people who come in through your door you know, as opposed to taking a more community approach to sort of say, okay, you know, one of the things we did when I was in working with faculty affairs, we didn't just work with those faculty members who the chair said, this person has a problem or things like that. We went after all the faculty, yeah. you know, and we tried to, so, because when you would find people who were having problems or about to have problems, but either didn't want to bring them to attention or their chair didn't want to necessarily bring it out or was ignoring them and things like that. And so if you really take that inclusive, you know, type of approach, you know, not unlike, for example, in Cuba, I'm told, you know, their health system, they, they don't just simply wait for someone to walk through their clinic. They're assigned to a whole community and they sort of say, hey, no one has seen, you know, Aunt Sadie, you know, for six weeks now. And yet we know she has congestive heart failure. Send somebody out there to find yes. out how she's doing. It is you completely know. different there. I love Cuba. Yeah. I've been there twice in yeah. the last two years and the way that they work together and do things and and they're very poor but they work together mm -hmm. and as a community and their spirit is just amazing so i think yeah, yeah and they have, learn and a I, lot i think in many cases they have better health outcomes than we do in yes respect, they were sending know, so. the cute they were sending their cuban doctors to help with the COVID effort around, yep. around the world I'm so well, so we it is almost that yeah, we're almost at nine o'clock, but I want to just give you a couple more minutes to just, if you want to conclude with anything. So let me conclude. I mean, I'm happy that people know how to get a hold of me. I'm in the pathology department. I'm more than happy to have, you know, further ongoing conversations with anybody about anything, you know, that might be of interest. Um, a couple of other things from a career point of view, it was an eye opener when I worked with Pfizer. Uh, that was the first and only time I worked for a corporation. Uh, corporations are very different from academia and from regular medicine. Uh, I think they have their pros and cons, you know. So, for example, you know, academics are very good at discovering new ideas and new possibilities for treatments and things like that, but they're not particularly good at doing all the safety things and all of the toxicology stuff and getting things through the FDA and things like that. So that's where you need your companies. On the other hand, companies are very profit-driven, um, and you can't escape that. And so uh, but one thing I did learn, you know, because I think we in medicine and academia often look at the pharmaceutical companies as the bad guys who are only interested in drugs and things like that, uh, monies and profits and things like that. And, and not to say that they are, but frankly, no organization is any better than the integrity of the individual people that are in that organization. So I, when I was working at Pfizer, we ran across people who frankly were not being that ethical um, on the academic side, you know, uh, they were pushing their own, uh, you know, interests and pushing their own particular drug because they knew they had uh, stock in the company and things like that. And these were professors and things like that. And they were called on the carpet by the pharmaceutical people. So you've got good and bad people on both sides, but, but that's one experience. And that's really a career opportunity. Realize though, if you go to work for a company, they really want you to work for those things that are gonna make them money, you know, not necessarily improve you know, the health of folks not necessarily improve, uh, you know, um, our knowledge of a particular area and things like that. And then the last thing is that, you know, in my, um, I don't know if you call it twilight years or whatever, I'm 69, you know, I don't know how much more I'll be around, uh, but I've started this company Take Charge because I've, certainly from my experience up in uh, Flint, I mean, I realize that a lot of people need some individual coaching and mentoring as far as just their health conditions. Probably even you all as physicians, 
you know, have had family members contact you and sort of say, hey, I don't understand this lab test, or hey, why does this doctor ask me to do this or that? Why do I need this test? What is, you know, um, you know, what is a gallstone? You know, why should that be giving me problems and things like that? Well, a lot of the general public needs that kind of information. And so even though I try to really do that in a truly interprofessional way, bringing together not only physicians, but also in the case of my case, what we've set up right now, health educators, a nutritionist, a fitness coach, a behavioral health specialists that deal with addictions and things like that. Uh, using that integrated approach, I try to get U of M to buy into it. They wouldn't buy into it. They say they're doing it already. This is expected of a lot of clinics that say they're running a primary care program. So I just fed up and just said, look, I'm going to start my own company. And so that's what I'm doing, you know, right now. And it's too early to see whether or not this is going to be successful. But, you know, the intent is really to try to give individual patients the kind of advocacy, health information, health coaching uh, that they need. I'm tired of, you know, an obese diabetic, you know, being told by that physician, well, you just need to exercise and, and yeah, and that's not, and then, and then they, they don't tell them anything else, you know. Yeah, that's thing. not helpful. Yeah, yeah. so I, I just think as the, as the rep of the residents, we're excited to get involved. And I think this is something that, as you mentioned, we do with our families and friends a lot anyway. So to be able to really get it into the communities and to the people who need it, um, I think is a really exciting opportunity. Yeah. So. And there's no reason. I mean, you know, pathologists do a lot of teaching in the medical school level about general health issues and, you know, different diseases. I mean, we're very knowledgeable about the different disease entities. There's no reason why we can't go out into the community and uh, mention these same things. I mean, I've been asked a number of times now uh, to talk about coronavirus. You know, I'm not an expert in coronavirus, but definitely you've got a lot of concerns about that and basic things about what is a virus. Why should yeah. you wear a mask? What does a mask yeah. do? And things like yeah. that. What do you We can do that? that. We can do, we can that. do that. Yeah. You know, and the need is there. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gordon, for talking with us today. I think I enjoyed everything, and okay. I well, loved hearing you. your story yeah. just in our conversation, so I'm glad you were able to speak to a broader audience. So. Yes, well, I'm happy to do so, and again, I'm happy to follow up with anyone. You know, you know where to get me. I'm in, in my All office right. at NCRC, you know, and I'm around. I'm on page, so yep. I'm happy Sounds to good. talk with anybody and, uh, you know, uh, brainstorm with anyone, uh, okay. and if I can be of help from a mentoring point of view, happy to do that. Yeah. Yep, and um, for the residents, we'll be kind of working with Dr. Gordon more on the diversity curriculum and kind of bringing some of these ideas to light. Um, and then there will be a recording of this presentation available on YouTube that we will share. So, um, yep, if there's nothing else, I think we'll conclude for this morning. But thank you very much, and I hope everybody okay. has a good day.